So in a few minutes, we've Great. <laughs> we're also recording the webinar, you may have just heard that. Um, yeah, so in a few minutes, we're going to hear from our three amazing speakers. Um, so May, who is from the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development, is going to be speaking to us via a video tonight um, because uh, she's in the Philippines. And we also have Adrian from Afrodad. Um, he has unfortunately had an electricity blackout and I'm hoping that at some point he'll manage to drop in. But if not, we've also got a recording of his speech um, just because obviously electricity, access to electricity isn't equal all over the world. Um, but we've got Jerome who is from JDC and he's here today and he will be here to answer some questions from you. Um, yeah, and then I guess the reason this webinar is happening is that there's some amazing young people from the Youth Christian Climate Network the Young Christian Climate Movement, sorry, are walking a relay at the moment. Um, and they're going from Cornwall to Glasgow in time for the COP, which is the UN climate talks, which are happening in November. And um, so they just reached Bristol and they asked us um, to put on this webinar almost as a celebration of that, because um, it's a big achievement. And so we've got Molly and Sophie with us and they are now gonna tell us a little bit about why they're doing what they're doing, how you can get involved. And I believe that Molly has some pictures of the relay so far that she's going to share with you. Um, so Sophie, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Sky. Thanks for having us here. Um, it's really lovely to be hosted by the Jubilee Debt Campaign for this webinar this evening. Um, so my name is Sophie and I'm from the Young Christian Climate Network. Um, the Young Christian Climate Network is a action focused community of young, uh, young Christians aged 18 to 30 from different denominations all around the UK. Um, and basically the thing that unites us is that we're choosing to follow Jesus in pursuit of climate justice. And that's kind of our main um, our main aim and our main role. Um, so this year our big project is that we are putting on a relay to COP26. So the relay started in on the 14th of June I believe um, down in Carbis Bay where the G6 summits were happening um, which were another um, significant climate ne negotiations that, ha that are happening this year and then it's slowly making its way up the country and then we'll finish in November just in time for the COP26 climate negotiations. Um, and the reason that we're doing this movement is because we are really aware that climate change costs the earth and it's pushing different countries into debt. So we're hoping that we that we can walk as an act of faith and hope, um, sorry, of, <laughs> of faith and love, um, both for our planet and for one another. And we've got this message of rise to the moment that we're really hoping um, will like gain traction and um, <clears throat> Um, and we're hoping that kind of more and more people will hear about it and more and more people will then kind of get behind our aims and our messages. So we're really hoping that we can show um, that we care about climate justice, care about climate creation and to raise awareness of the COP that's happening. Um, but specifically, we're calling on the UK government to do um, four specific things, if I may. So the first one is reinstating the foreign aid budget um, to 0.7% the pre-COVID levels after it, um, after it was um, taken down a few months ago. And also, I think today they um, it passed in the Houses of Parliament that it would drop. Um, we're also hoping to, um, well, we're calling the government to secure agreement from rich countries to, to you know, raise their commitment for climate finance. Um, we're thinking about um, loss and damage policies, encouraging governments to think about um, adopting a fair, fair loss and damage policy. And then also we're pushing for the, um, the debts of the world's poorest countries to be cancelled so that um, as we, as a united earth, a united nation, as we strive towards climate justice, other, um, different countries, depending on their level of finances and their abilities, aren't pushed into debt because of this. So basically, our key message is climate change costs the earth. Um, in this process, this is pushing different countries in the debt, into debt. So we want to um, rise to the moment and walk as an act of faith, hope and love. So how can people get involved? I'll keep this quite short. Um, we would love people to join us en route as walkers. Though it is the Young Christian Climate ne Network, um, we would love people of all ages, all um, faith denominations, all faith backgrounds, 
um, to join us on this walk. Um, if you're not able to join us on walk, you can also join us in different residency hubs. So yesterday, um, the relay arrived into Bristol and is now stationary in Bristol, where I'm based, for a week. And during this week, we've got lots of different fun events from, you know, this webinar tonight. Earlier, we did a prayer and gardening event at Hazelnut Community Farm. And um, we've got an eco Eucharist uh, tomorrow. And on Thursday, we've got a big celebration on College Green. Um, so we would, I would like to, um, I would love to invite you to come to the Bristol events if you're local to Bristol. And if not, join the residency hub events where you, where you might be based um, um, if you're in the UK. Um, you can also volunteer to help either with kind of on-call support whilst the relay is happening or whilst it's stationary in those residencies. And finally, I think we would really appreciate prayer as we go along. For the YCCN members that are organising this, it's 99% on volunteers, 99% on um, uh, like donate small donations that people are giving us we're not we're not fundraising for it um, but we're we've been I think overwhelmed so far it's been going for four weeks and nothing serious has gone wrong yet and we've been really overwhelmed by God's blessing and provision through this whole relay um, so I think somebody's just posted a link in the chat of how to get involved um, and I think I'll hand over to Molly now so Molly has done a bit of the walking so far whereas I'm based in Bristol and we'll be walking on after um, Molly do you want to talk a little bit about um, your experience of um, the Relay so far and maybe share some pictures. Yeah, I will do. Um, thank you so much. And yeah, thank you um, to Jubilee Debt Campaign for having me. I'm really um, excited to learn from, learn from the rest of the panellists. Um, I've just shared my screen. Um, Sophie, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see that? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm Molly. Um, I'm a member of YCCN and I'm also uh, coordinating uh, the volunteers for the central section of the relay um, from Salisbury to Sheffield. Um, and I uh, was lucky enough to walk the first day of the of the relay. Uh, I'm also planning to walk two days out of Oxford and a few days at the very end into Glasgow. Um, so as Sophie mentioned, um, the relay is now in Bristol. Um, this was them being welcomed yesterday. Um, this group that you can see is two separate contingents of walkers. Um, so there was the main route that was um, coming from Exeter. And then there was also a separate Welsh route that was traveling in parallel. And this was them um, being met. And yeah, there are there are loads of loads of great events happening in, in Bristol at the moment. Um, but if we sort of rewind a few weeks, um, this is us uh, kicking off the relay in Cornwall. Um, and we're sort of meeting outside this, this church. That's a picture of me um, waving a flag um, in on the coast path uh, at Carbis Bay, which is where the G7 ministers were meeting and um, making some arguably fairly disappointing decisions. Um, so the flag that I'm that I'm holding uh, needs a bit of context. Um, so it's not only people that are traveling along our relay, we're also being joined by a boat, a model boat. Um, which is um, joining us in each of the residency hub cities and ending up in Glasgow with us. Um, and this boat is um, kind of symbolizes for us um, our hope that at COP26 we'll set sail towards a more just future. Um, and it also um, kind of encapsulates this idea that we've been thinking about a lot um, during the pandemic as well as with climate change, that uh, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Um, so it's a global problem, but some nations are suffering more than others, and debt burden is a big part of that, which we'll be hearing about more later. Um, so the most important part of our boat is that is its sails, um, and its sails are made up of fabrics that have been sent to us by um, Christian communities in climate vulnerable uh, communities all over the world. Um, so we've got some fabrics from Vanuatu, from Grenada, um, Zambia, Nepal, Laos, and others, many others. Um, and uh, this flag that you can see, that you'll see quite a lot in the upcoming photos, um, is uh, the kind of top part of the sail. So whenever we get reunited with the boats at the residency hubs, it slots in. But this is kind of like our Olympic torch or baton that we're carrying for every day of the walk. Um, and that's a picture of me um, handing the, the flag to Will while I'm trying to navigate a particularly tricky style on our route on the first day. 
Um, so uh, we've had um, amazing experiences during, during the walking so far. We've had a variety of weather. Um, so on the right, you can see um, some of our walkers um, in beautiful sunshine, beautiful views. Um, and then on the left, you can see some of our walkers um, in the middle of very misty, rainy Dartmoor having a nice ice cream break. Um, speaking of delicious things, uh, we've also been um, blessed with some amazing hospitality along our way from individuals and churches and community groups. Um, and this was a staggering cake that um, someone made for us in Cornwall while we were passing through her community. Um, we've had um, all sorts of uh, kind of meet and greet events and we've met um, loads of different people along our way um, to talk to them about our message. Um, so we've given some talks in schools um, and in the top photo you can see um, the Welsh contingent meeting a primary school and a secondary school. Um, then on the bottom left um, that's our relay and our boat um, repping YCCN at the Devon County Fair or County Show. Um, and then on the bottom right um, that's a group of our walkers uh, meeting the mayor of Truro. So as we go along, um, we're trying to you know, get local media involved and we're also trying to reach out to um, MPs and community figures in order in kind of in the hope that our message will be, will be spread and will end up um, being aired at COP. Um, we've also had a huge amount of support from, from churches um, along our way. Um, who have hosted us, provided accommodation in their, on their church hall floors, um, who've done services and prayers for us, um, and who have offered meet and greet events, and just really given us the opportunity to, um, to spread the word. Um, so at the bottom, that's the picture of uh, where I was this weekend, just gone. Um, I was in Wells Cathedral uh, while the walkers were passing nearby, um, giving, a, giving the address in Evensong about, about our relay. Um, so I hope that's given just kind of um, a brief uh, flavour of, of what, the, what the walking has been like so far on a daily basis. It's been one of the most amazing things for me has been seeing so many different people getting involved. Um, people of all ages have been walking, um, including some over 80 year olds who have put our younger, younger walkers to shame. Um, and, uh, but there are, as Sophie says, loads of ways to get involved, not just walking. Um, and it's been really wonderful to be part of this um, community that's passionate about climate justice. And I really feel that um, our message uh, promoting fair climate finance and debt justice really has been spreading throughout UK churches and beyond. And I really hope that that message will continue to spread and that it will be heard at COP26 too. Um, so thank you very much. I think that's that's everything I wanted to say, but do feel free to ask more questions about the kind of day to day of the um, of the relay at the end. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, both of you. It was so lovely to hear about that. Um, yes, yeah, so if you do have any questions for either Sophie or Molly um, or any of the other speakers later on, although it looks like only Jerome will be able to answer them right now. Um, if you're at the bottom, you should see a thing that says Q&A, and if you drop your questions in there, when we have time for questions, I will read them all out to the panellists. Um, and if you struggle to find the Q&A, dropping them in the chat box is also okay, I'll keep an eye on it. Right, um, so we are now going to hear from May Buenaventura from the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development. Um, unfortunately, May couldn't be here in person this evening, so she has sent us a video, which I believe should be appearing on your screens any moment now. There we go. Right. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to share some of our perspectives from the South on debt and climate. Now, the debt and climate crisis may initially seem unconnected, but we know for a fact that they are inextricably linked and count among the greatest and continuing injustices against peoples of the South. First, they share common roots in the same global economic and financial system that breeds and exacerbates injustice and inequality across and within countries and generates a net outflow of resources from the South to the North. 
It has created a financial system at the service of profit and wealth accumulation by elites and corporations, which subordinates southern economies to the global market and impoverishes southern countries and billions of people globally. Loans have been pushed upon us by international and northern creditors and borrowings pursued by southern elites with a justification that our economies need capital infusion for development and to address poverty. As debts mounted, more loans were offered and the vicious cycle of borrowing to repay loans began. Peoples and communities to the south have been rendered most vulnerable to climate change impacts because of poverty, discrimination, and the precariousness of their living conditions, which are greatly intensified under ever-rising debt problems. It is a system that is clearly extractivist in essence and character, extractivist of both human and natural resources for the relentless pursuit of profit and with excessive and ever-increasing use of fossil fuel energy. But we only see false solutions being foisted upon us. Debt relief measures have historically and to the present day remained inadequate. They primarily stem from the interest to stabilize southern economies so they may continue to repay debts and conduct business as usual and clean their books to be able to continue borrowing. They are carefully designed so that the logic of the capitalist system and markets are not subverted and the interests of creditors are not compromised. Justice and real systemic solutions are not part of the equation. Most Southern governments are culpable as well. They are more concerned about protecting foreign investors and domestic elites, maintaining credit worthiness and pursuing loans and leaving their economies in business as usual mode. In relation to climate, many countries of the global north have made recent pronouncements of so-called greater ambition in climate action, but they speak of net zero, a deceptive and dangerous concept which still permits greenhouse gas emissions and thus allows evading the responsibility of reaching real zero. Even with reduced GHG emissions, the targets for net zero are way beyond the timeline needed to keep global temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Moreover, despite the promise of climate finance to reach a minimum of $100 billion a year by 2025, which is an amount already very inadequate, the pledges in the last six years have barely reached $4 billion a year. The actual delivery is even lower. Global North countries' public subsidies for fossil fuels are five times bigger than their climate finance pledges. Furthermore, a big proportion of these pledges are in the form of loans, which betray the principle and intent of climate finance. Reflecting the efforts of movements and people's organizations to advance the concept of climate debt, the UNFCCC lays down the principle of CBDR, or Common but Differentiated Responsibilities, which recognizes historical responsibility for the accumulation of greenhouse gases. While the Convention does not use the term climate debt, it pinpoints the period of industrialization in the North as the period of GHG emissions growth, leading to excessive accumulation in the atmosphere and the start of global warming and climate change. In line with this principle, the Convention states that developed countries should deliver climate finance for developing countries for mitigation and adaptation. This is our starting point, that the peoples of the Global South contributed the least to both the debt and climate crisis, and yet bear its enslaving and far-reaching consequences. It is thus only just that those who have the biggest share of responsibility for these problems, those who accumulated wealth in the process, are those primarily 
required and obligated to address these problems. Lasting solutions to the debt crisis are clear. Debt cancellation is a vital step to free up public resources for urgently needed public goods and services, especially in the face of the health pandemic, its economic fallout, which has intensified the suffering of billions already living in poverty, and the worsening climate crisis. Debt cancellation is equally demanded by the injustice of illegitimate debt. Much of the debts being claimed from the South are illegitimate. They destroyed the environment and worsened the climate crisis, dislocated communities, and violated many other human rights. Debt cancellation is also critical in paving the way for more strategic and structural reforms in the economies of Southern countries to stop the constant bleeding and borrowing and to build strong, equitable, gender just, and sustainable economies. Climate solutions based on science, fair shares, and justice are also clear. Mitigation actions must be based on historical and continuing share of responsibility for GHG emissions to keep temperature rise below 1.5 degrees. For the richest countries, this means reaching real zero emissions domestically by 2030 and meeting the balance of their fair shares of emissions reduction through climate finance for mitigation. Another important aspect is adaptation and building resilience and dealing with loss and damage from already ongoing and worsening impacts. The costs must be delivered through climate finance, defined in the UNFCCC as the charge of rich industrialized countries because of their huge share of responsibility for climate change. For southern countries, measures should not just be narrowly aimed at addressing climate-related disasters, but at transforming economies. We also need to claim restitution and reparations for climate debt within countries based on class, gender, race, and other dimensions of marginalization and exploitation. The peoples of the South are in fact owed a massive climate debt, a debt that is part of the huge historical, social, economic, and ecological debt owed by the global North to the global South from centuries of plunder and exploitation, which have resulted in the destruction of our eco ecosystems, the maldevelopment and domination of our economies, the impoverishment of our peoples, and the reproduction and exacerbation of inequalities within and across nations. It is a legacy of colonization that continues to this day as part of neoliberal capitalist globalization with the active collaboration of Southern elites and governments. Financial debt payments being collected from us are minuscule amounts compared to the climate debt and ecological debt owed to the South. Climate debt is what we are demanding, not as charity, but as justice, through restitution and reparations from those who historically are responsible for starting climate change and who contribute the most to its intensification. These are countries, classes, and corporations that drive and profit the most from the economic systems and the global system that has led to a fast escalating global warming and climate change. Finally, we must underscore that addressing the debt and climate crisis cannot advance without fighting for system change. We can only bring about a just resolution of these problems through the profound transformation of the global system and of national economies. So let me end there with warm appreciation for your time and also to give full credit to our coordinator, Lydia Nakpil, for her words and thoughts on climate and debt that I just shared. I wish you all a successful webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much to May for that. Um, so we are now going to hear from Jerome Phelps, who works on policy at Jubilee Debt Campaign. Um, Jerome, are you here? Hello, yes. Great. 
Thanks, Guy, um, and thank you, May, um, for such a powerful introduction. I'm going to start to try to underline the, how, how the climate crisis and the debt crisis are connected. I'm going to start with two important things that happened on small islands in the last few days. Um, you may have seen uh, about 10 days ago, um, Hurricane Elsa um, struck the Caribbean, um, this marking the start of this year's hurricane season in the Caribbean. It's actually the earliest hurricane um, for 16 years, so it's a really ominous sign. Um, people in the Caribbean are terrified about um, hurricanes. For example, Hurricane Maria in 2017 um, uh, damaged 90% of structures on the, the island, um, cost $1.3 billion of damage, which for at the tiny island of Dominica amounts to 226% of its GDP. That's um, two years and three months of um, everything it, it earns. In my younger, more naive days, when you hear when you hear about disasters, you think you hear about urgent appeals going out. You think there's some kind of international fund that pays for these things. It's like my, my adult equivalent of there being no Father Christmas is there's really no fund that's doing this for for Dominica. Certainly, um, that it's get countries like Dominica get into debt to pay for this. Um, it's Dominica's debt went up to. Uh, three quarters of GDP um, in 2017 as a direct consequence of the, the disaster. And these hurricanes are, that we don't call them natural disasters anymore, they are human-induced climate extreme events. They're becoming more common, more intense because of climate change caused by, as May set out, the, the global north, not caused by Dominica, not caused by Caribbean islands. Um, the small island developing states as a whole, not just in the Caribbean, uh, contributed 0.2% of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and yet they're bearing the, the brunt of um, the, the impact of climate change on the ground. So as May said, a climate debt is owed um, to, by, by us in the north to countries like Dominica. And this um, is part of the, the global problem of this of the global debt crisis that's been developing since 2008, which is hitting um, climate vulnerable countries more severely than almost anywhere else. They're the most indebted countries in the world. Um, three quarters of the most damaging disasters since 2000 have been tropical storms in small island developing states. They're the most in, um, exposed to climate events um, and then they suffer the most extreme damage. They have very, they have very little diversified economies. It's a legacy of colonialism that the economies were built around one or, um, or usually one export crop for the benefit of the colonizers rather than for their own sustainability. So it's very easily wiped out by a storm. Um, and the, um, so in the last 10 years, the external debt of SIDS, the small island developing states has risen by 24% on average. So they're really at the forefront of um, the debt crisis and the climate crisis. The second thing that happened in the last few days on an island, a very different island, Venice, um, where the, the global financial system was partially born a few centuries ago, um, G20 finance ministers met in a very different environment. Um, the G20 um, being the body that has taken on itself responsibility for coordinating the response to the global debt crisis. Um, the, 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 obviously, the group of 20 have developed large economies, rich countries, largely in the global north. Um, these are the countries that caused the climate crisis, as well as including the UK and many of the others that colonised um, the countries that are experiencing the sharp end. They, one of the things that the G20 finance ministers discussed was their response to the, the debt crisis, the, the two initiatives the debt, suspension, debt service suspension initiative, which delayed some debts um, last year as a response to the pandemic, um, and the common framework, which is intended to be a, a framework for restructuring debt um, in the pandemic period going forward. Um, the, 
the G20 finance ministers were very pleased with themselves about their progress. They, they welcomed the progress of the debt service suspension initiative, saying it has saved poor countries $4.6 billion, which sounds like a lot till you remember this is a global level and countries, uh, poor countries not eligible for it had to pay a trillion dollars last year. So it's a drop in the ocean. They re reiterated their commitment to the common framework. They didn't mention that in the midst of a debt crisis, only three countries in the world have even applied to the common framework because they can see it's not going to help them. And one of them is actually negotiating with its creditors outside the common framework, Ethiopia. It's, it's dying on its feet because it doesn't have any serious commitment to cancelling debt. It doesn't require private, com private creditors, multinational companies to come to the table and um, participate in, uh, it doesn't force them to cancel their debts. And it excludes middle income countries, which include most of the most climate vulnerable countries where three quarters of poor people in the world live, including most of the Caribbean. They can't even, they're not even eligible for these grossly inadequate steps. So as May said, the, the climate crisis and the debt crisis are, are connected, they're inextricably connected. The, the climate crisis is exacerbating the debt crisis because countries like Dominica are, are borrowing to deal with the, the desire, to deal with climate change in general, to deal with climate extreme events. Um, they're in debt to the global north over to pay for the costs of a climate crisis caused by the global north. Um, that every time there's a disaster, which is increasingly happening every year in the Caribbean, they get more in debt. They take out more loans with, um, often um, they issue bonds, they take out more loans with um, North Global North companies. Um, they're not, the Global North, as May said, is not, uh, we're not meeting our responsibilities, our commitments we've already made to provide uh, climate finance that would enable countries to respond and adapt. Much of the climate finance that is being given is in the form of loans, which further increases the debts. It's just piling debt upon an already unsustainable and grossly unjust debt situation. And in addition, the, um, the, mar the markets and their wisdom are starting to factor in climate change, which sounds like a sensible thing to do until you realize that means Dominique, when um, Dominica is trying to borrow, um, it's the creditors will, the companies will factor in, mm, you're likely to have a lots of hurricanes, you're going to struggle to pay your debt, so the interest you have to pay is even greater. So they're actually being punished um, for being the victims of the climate change that Global North is, is generating. And it actually, the, the connection actually goes the other way as well, the debt crisis is undermining or a country's ability to, to adapt to and mitigate the climate crisis because so much of their resources are going to servicing debt payments. We talk a lot about a Jubilee debt campaign about the, um, how many countries are spending more on debt than on their health care in the pandemic, but this also applies to responding to climate change, to the green, the green transition, which we'll, we'll all need to do ultimately. Countries simply cannot afford it because their, their economies are racked with paying off debt because they're not being given um, comp the loss and damage compensation that um, they, um, they're entitled to by the Global North. In some cases, like Suriname, um, credit, private creditors are actually specifically demanding that they drill for gas in order to generate revenues, in order to pay off, to make their debt more sustainable in future. So the, the profits from fossil fuels should go straight to the private creditors that previous corrupt rulers have um, borrowed from. So this, the, the, this situation is fundamentally unjust and it's fundamentally prevent, going to prevent the world from responding adequately to the, the climate emergency. Climate justice requires debt justice, not just because we need justice, but also because we need, a, we, we need to respond to the emergency for all of our, the sake of our, all of our societies, not just in the global south. So what we need is um, both large-scale debt cancellation for all countries that need it, that can free up resources to not just respond to the pandemic, 
um, but also meet their wider sustainable development goals and respond to the, the climate crisis. So we need debt cancellation, but we, and we also, as May said, need um, climate finance that recognises the, the, um, the climate debt, uh, that recognises the commitments made by UK and global North countries, and is based on grants, not loans, that doesn't add to the, um, the debt crisis, the debt, the unsustainable debt, so that um, global South countries can participate in adapting their economies to, um, to a sustainable future. It, this is a moment where it can, it's easy to feel to despair on um, when you're talking about climate or debt for that matter, but this is a moment where, uh, particularly in the UK, there is more opportunity to get put pressure on our government to, to act. The UK is ho hosting the COP26 conference, does want it to succeed. They know that it will not succeed if um, Global South are fobbed off again on, climate, on debt and um, climate finance. Global South countries are going to be pushing really hard for some serious um, measures to address this. We as British citizens and European Global North citizens can be pushing our governments to um, step up, acknowledge that the debt, debt justice is central to climate justice and start taking serious steps to address them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jerome. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions come in for Jerome, um, but I'm going to save them to the end. Um, and just before we have those questions, we're going to hear from Adrian Chikawura, who is from Afrodad. Adrian was hoping to be here tonight, as I mentioned earlier, um, but has is in an electric black electricity blackout, um, and it looks like he's still still not got any electricity. So we're going to have a video from him, and maybe he'll be able to join us for questions. But otherwise, you've just got Jerome with you. Right. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, within this webinar, uh, debt and climate crisis, a perfect a perfect storm. Um, for my delivery, I think I'll speak about this in the context of the African continent. And maybe I should start by highlighting that um, the world is facing a triple crisis of debt, climate change and biodiversity loss. The impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economic systems have increased volatility in developing country markets where high levels of debt make them vulnerable. The pandemic could severely undermine current responses to this crisis, which were already inadequate to address their scale. Systemic change is urgently needed to support the sustainability through the pandemic and to ensure consistent and long-term progress towards tackling the interconnected and complex global challenges. Amongst low-income regions on the globe, Sub-Saharan Africa is the region least responsible for the global climate change, but most vulnerable to its impacts. A multitude of actors are involved in directing climate finance to the region, both to support low carbon development and to help countries adapt to the severe impacts of uh, severe impacts that are already being felt. Financing architectures such as the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, the Africa Climate Change Fund, the ACCF, are currently the biggest cumulative multilateral climate funds active in the region followed by the Least Developed Country Fund, LTCF, and the World Bank Administered uh, Clean Technology Fund. But for financing checked under these funds, the Climate Finance, uh, Climate Finance Unit data indicates that 4.5 US, 4.5 billion US dollars has been approved for 665 projects and programs throughout Sub-Saharan Africa since 2003. Almost half of the approved funding from these multilateral uh, climate funds has been provided for adaptation measures. And I should note that um, grant financing has been used and has played a crucial role, especially for adaptation actions in ensuring that climate interventions secure multiple gender responsive benefits for the most vulnerable countries and population groups. 
However, given that the discourse of debt, climate resilience, and the COVID pandemic recovery have dominated global conversations, for many developing countries, especially the poorest, the overwhelming barrier to addressing all three is their debt burdens. This is because sub-Saharan African countries have faced the COVID crisis with already high debt levels, and this burden, the climate burden, has only the COVID burden rather has only become heavier. And as such, there is no simple solution to the problem of developing country debt in view of the climate crisis that the Africa region faces. I think it is also important to note that sad. Saharan Africa is currently affected worst by the climate crisis, but lacks uh, access to adequate financing for a comprehensive response. Uh, in terms of uh, statistics, rather, 14% of the world's population lives in sub-Saharan Africa, yet only 3% of global climate finance flows into the continent. More so, cash-strapped African Governments do not have the luxury of borrowing expensively to finance green recoveries from the coronavirus pandemic. More than half of African countries are estimated to be in debt distress, with interest payments accounting for at least a quarter of government tax revenues in 2020 and rising to around 40% in some countries. The cost of dealing with intensifying climate impacts such as droughts, flooding, and um, tropical storms have not gone away. It is to the knowledge of a lot of uh, people or sectors, development sectors, that uh, regions such as Southern Africa and East Africa have faced cyclones such as the cyclone Idai which ravaged um, Mozambique, parts of Malawi and Zimbabwe, and also swarms of locusts affected agricultural produce in East Africa, as well as the Horn uh, of Africa. And in some African countries, up to 10% of GDPs, of their GDPs, have been diverted to adapting to climate change, as highlighted by the African finance ministers in 2020. For African countries, the need for debt relief is increasingly urgent. A report by the World Bank on poor country debt in October 2020 noted that debt burden in 73 of the poorest countries climbed to a record 744 billion US dollars. This was at a pace of debt accumulation almost twice that of other low and middle income countries. The climate crisis thereby accessibates the problem as it compounds the vulnerability of poor countries' cost of borrowing. In trying to solve this triple effect kind of crisis that uh, the world faces, that the African continent faces as well, the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, have been pushing for the use of debt for climate swaps, a mechanism that entails finance in the forms of grants and debt swaps, which allow for debt to be transferred to an organization or country in return for commitments to specific conservation measures. For example, those that would help a country to continue with its uh, climate resilience work. This approach of debt for climate swaps, albeit having strong proponents, is problematic in that it does not mobilize adequate resources to respond to the effects of climate change within and amongst countries. More so, climate finance, including debt swap, swaps access, are to some extent or some degree based on credit worthiness assessments from credit rating agencies such as Moody's and Fitch. And this is a challenge for borrower countries in African LDCs and fragile and conflict-affected uh, uh, states because most have some of the lowest access or levels of accessibility to global credit. As such, lenders 
including emerging lenders, are reluctant to invest in countries that are at greater risk of default, whether this is related to economic stability, transparency, or accountability. So given the limited availability of finance in low-income countries, much of their finance is used to address immediate needs, such as infrastructure, which severely limits financing for longer term and systemic needs like climate resilience. A topical issue I think I should mention this within the policy debates on climate finance or climate and debt is the rising discourse on special drawing rights, which are international reserve assets that are all IMF member state or member countries get to have a share of, albeit at different quarters. In the dire context of a COVID-19 pandemic in which African states find themselves in, the SDRs are aimed at strengthening international finance for post-pandemic uh, for post-pandemic recovery and unlocking bilateral donor financing without necessarily increasing ODA spending and without worsening uh, their fiscal position. Whilst the main purpose uh, of SDRs is to support recovery of hard-hit low-income countries from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the challenge obtaining is the 23 billion of the 650 billion SDR allocations to low-income countries, which some of African uh, countries uh, are to benefit from are actually low and inadequate to respond to the economic debt health and climate challenges the continent is facing, thereby raising questions on whether the global financial architecture on debt and official development assistant, assistance ought to create climate investment funds where SDRs could be allocated for climate-related investments in developing economies. Moving forward, and I think this will be me rounding up, as we look towards engaging COP26, it is no doubt that the pandemic has offered an opportunity to tackle the health, economic slash debt and climate crisis all at once. We therefore call for a recovery that entails that climate finance does not perpetuate the use of loans, we should believe accessible and sustainable debt accruals in the region. We also call for uh, a recovery that entails that, or that entails investing in climate resilient infrastructure that considers land rights and management of the resource and applies natural capital accounting and assessment tools to ensure trade-offs, take full account of value of nature to people and the economy. We also call for uh, a recovery that entails investing in nature-based solutions and uh, the removal and the redirecting of fossil fuel subsidies to fund green recovery measures that drive job creation. With this, colleagues, I thank you. Amazing. So we send our thanks to Adrian in Zimbabwe and I'm really sorry that he couldn't join us tonight. And we've had quite a lot of questions in, so I'm going to open to Jerome for questions in a minute. Um, but also, if any of you have any questions for Molly or Sophie about the relay and how you can get involved, feel free to drop them in as well. Um, so, Jerome, the first question that we've got for you is from David, who says, I live in Glasgow and hope to be involved with COP26. My question is, how do we get the countries of the global north to acknowledge that climate change is an international emergency? For instance, when Hurricanes Ida and Kenneth hit Mozambique and Malawi, the IMF gave them loans repayable with interest to repair the damage. This is both unsustainable and acceptable. How do we get this kind of support turned into a grant? That is a, a big, the big question. This is what we're, <laughs> we're asking ourselves every day as we strategize for how to have more leverage. Um, today, it's particularly clear that the, um, our government sees um, global, global justice as not a vote winner and not a priority, and that certainly, certainly applies to climate justice as well. I think the way we do it is the long, hard work of, of organizing ourselves, 
getting out, doing walks, talking to people as, as Molly and Sophie are doing, uh, making it making it personal, as somebody else has mentioned in the, the questions, um, getting getting more awareness, getting more energy, communicating that to MPs, which is the, the opportunity that we have um, as citizens of a, one of the, the G20 states that we do have routes to indirectly to, to influence our government to, um, to tell them that they're wrong, that this is a priority for, for um, voters. And building solidarity with uh, movements um, and following the, following the asks and demands of movements like Asian People's Movement for De Development, like um, Afro Dad, um, and that kind of international solidarity. So it's not, so it's experienced as a justice issue um, that we are supporting Global South leadership to demand justice um, rather than an abstract charity for poor people somewhere else. So I think that's, and we need to we need to all get better at finding ways for those clear demands for justice from the, the global south to be heard in in global north governments, particularly the UK, our own. Great, thanks, Jerome. And obviously, it's very unfortunate I'm having to answer all of these questions um, as a global north person, but that's uh, infrastructure, global infrastructure inequality, as as you noticed. Yeah. Um, so the next question we've got is, today's UK Tory government is attempting to lower the amounts of capital to assist in overseas aid. How do we as a debt justice movement nationally respond? I think, yeah, I mean, similarly, really, I think it's um, obviously it's a connected issue. We haven't been directly working on the, the aid issue, which is um, obviously related, but distinct from the, the debt issue. Uh, but we're, it's is, is symptomatic of the government's um, reluctance to to engage with, global, with its global responsibilities and towards um, towards justice. And I think the answer is the same. I think we have to be uh, we have to be mobilising. We have to be building building for the long term with um, organisations working on aid um, as, as well as uh, the debt movement globally and changing changing the politics. Ultimately, convincing MPs that they're not going to be re-elected if they ignore this. Thanks. And what do you say to someone who rejects the idea of historic climate debt? I'd say you're in a you're in a very small minority because even our even our governments, whilst doing nothing in practice about it or very little, acknowledge in broad terms that there is such a debt. Um, the the, um, the UNFCCC, the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which the UK and all the main governments have signed up to, um, acknowledges um, different capabilities and differing responsibilities of individual countries for addressing climate change, which means it recognises that um, countries that had inter um, industrial revolutions in the 19th century and have been pumping out carbon since then um, have a lot more responsibility for this than countries that are just developing now uh, and that that brings responsibility for um, stepping up um, to, and they have uh, made this commitment to 100, 100 billion dollars a year of climate finance which is inadequate and not being met at the moment but I think I, at the level of acknowledging there's a problem here that we we are responsible for addressing, in effect that there's a climate debt, I think governments are doing that. It's um, demonstrably true that um, these, our societies are disproportionately responsible, and that in practice that amounts to a debt. You can disagree with doing anything about it, but I think it's hard to dispute that a, a debt exists. Yeah. Um. And so this one is about climate debt swaps. Um, so Andrew says, given the exploitative nature of typical developed to developing country deals, what kind of climate debt swaps would you support? Debt swaps. Yes. Um, this is a very, this is a big a big question we're talking about a lot and can get very technical. So, so to try and um, Keep it broad. Um, the de so debt swaps are being there. Are, there are one of the the sort of innovative solutions um, that are being much talked about in um, debt policy circles, and they're much hyped. Um, then um, 
they generally there's a lot of resistance to them in um, the global south, particularly, and the global north, um, for, um, because they for a number of reasons. Firstly, well, the, the idea is the simple idea is that um, um, Dominica um, gets to cancel its gets to swap its debt for investing in protecting its um, forests and sea life, for example. Um, in fact, Antigua is a better example in the Caribbean, which is doing one. So um, the gov the gov normally the governments that owe, are owed debt by Antigua agree to um, for Antigua to spend a proportion of that debt on um, climate um, response or um, sea life protection um, in order and to cancel the rest. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a nice it's in some ways it's a good way for can be a good way for making it more politically appealable to creditor countries to cancel the debt if they can call it a swap and say that it's doing some good um the point it doesn't go very far unless it's it's, it's only going to work if it's mostly can debt cancellation in practice for a country like antigua that has a lot of unsustainable debt it can't it doesn't have money to the money that it would be spending on debt it doesn't have that money so it can't then spend it on climate or other nice things you need to cancel the debt and then it can start to think about investing in the climate later in practice it the, the debt swaps there haven't been many they've been very small they haven't remotely touched the levels of debt cancellation that are needed by the current climate crisis the current debt crisis uh, they tend to be really bureaucratic. There's all sorts of questions about how much the resources that go into overseeing them and measuring the impacts. They're, the risk is that they're a, they're a distraction and they, they allow governments to say they're doing something about the debt crisis whilst shuffling around and not really doing much. So effectively, the short answer is we support them if they're effectively a front for debt cancellation. And we don't support them if they force um, global South countries to um, do its, their climate response that Global North creditors think they should be doing rather than what um, global, the, the societies and um, governments um, judge themselves most important. Great, thanks so much, Jerome. Um, David has a reflection, but I'm wondering if you want to respond to it, which is, I wonder if this webinar is not emphasizing the personal enough if we are to do to change minds, we must do more than speak in generalities. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think we we all need to um, to do in the debt movement. There's more we need to do to make this about people and not about abstractions. There is it's one of the big challenges when you're talking about debt is like, it's not an exciting word. And I find debt really exciting and a crucial economic justice issue because I'm working on it. I'm aware that it's not a concept that gets people excited or wanting to hear about it and I think we change that by not just talking about explaining the international finance system which is very complex and unexciting but also talking about what debt means on what what Dominica's debt means to somebody who's rebuilding their house who needs to get, um, get access health care because they've got COVID those are the we're, we're trying to do more to build partnerships that we as a uk based ngo um can can work with partners in the global south who do work with people on the ground directly affected and make those connections so that um so that the people on the ground know how far their their inability to get oxygen for their um their mother in um, a covid ward is related to um, how much their country is spending on debt as well as the obviously the the climate uh, um, response. Sky, do you mind if I jump in here as well? Of course. Yeah, thanks. I was um, at an event this morning, part of the relay, and we were talking about the kind of like the top down versus the bottom up approach and how actually they come together to form a really good middle ground. And I think maybe what David was referring to is the fact that 
in both of the people that are affected by debt and climate and also us we take the human out so as um as jerome was saying we think about international finance structures that nobody really understands so from our point of view especially in the uk and in the global north we say well we don't understand that and it's not directly affecting our lives so we don't need to think about it because it's not our responsibility and i think if we start thinking in terms of um the people's like the human people's lives that affect and also um nature and environment um, the environment and animals as well but if we think about the human side of it and then we also think about our individual response as humans here in the uk and wherever we are um then we can really start understanding how we can make a difference and i think some david put a uh, sorry uh yeah david put a reply back in the chat again that talks about um uh, non-violent direct action which yccn is really about and it's about basically raising awareness for what we as individuals can do and what we can then call upon the UK government to do because I as an individual only have a very small impact on what people in parliament are doing but in me joining in this national movement of YCCN in the relay I can play my part in a much bigger structure which I think David um, was complimenting XR for doing as they've done over the last um, 10 years or I, I can't remember how long XR um, has gone for but does that help a little bit? Yeah I think that was great um... It's uh, it's funny to me that you, um, you remember XR being around for ten years because they're much newer than that, which I think maybe speaks to speaks to how prominent some of the actions that they've been doing have been. Sorry, um, it's, yeah, time scales have gone out the window because of the pandemic. I think. Oh no, not a criticism, just more more highlighting that obviously that's made a big impact on people's consciousness. Um, and yeah, I think the, the whole collective action thing is is a very important point. Um, I think connected to that is Ruth's question, um, which if any of you want to answer this, that's fine, which is, are there any examples of positive actions being taken on debt justice that can be cited to encourage, um, I assume, encourage people to get involved with the campaign or to um, take action? I can come in again. There's a lot too much, far too much of me at the moment. So please come in, Sophie Molly, if you've got thoughts on any of this. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not um, our governments and um, global governments have take have um, in in living memory taken significant steps on um, on debt. Um, Jubilee debt campaign grew out, of course, with the, the Jubilee two thousand movement, which was a, a massive movement for debt um, debt cancellation, which did did have an impact, um, and. Um, did and did leads generate debt cancellation schemes that succeeded in bringing bringing down that particular crisis they didn't succeed in gener producing a fair sustainable um, debt system that wouldn't lurch back into crisis a few down, years down the road um, but countries are still um, the um, the the HIPAA um, scheme which came out of that for example Sudan and um, is um, still entering it now, um, many years later. So we are and getting its debt cancelled rather than delayed or restructured in um, the ways that are mostly being prioritised at the moment. Very, very problematic ways in, involving um, IMF conditionality, which is getting Sudanese people demonstrating on the streets for the last month or two. So they're, they're not... I wouldn't wholeheartedly call them good practices, but things can be done. And in support of that, the government, the UK government in 2010 passed legislation to prevent vulture funds holding out on debt restructurings to get more um, to, uh, to, and then claiming more than they would have got under that debt restructuring. So this is one of our one of our asks at the moment is for the government to pass similar but forward looking uh, legislation that would prevent abuse by private creditors sabotaging the whole um, debt uh, debt restructuring. So there are there are some positives uh, from the past, but political will seems to have um, dropped from the previous crisis to this one, and that's what we need to work on. Right. Um, and Cedric has asked. Um, who are the main creditors? I'm, I'm not sure if that's for the Caribbean or elsewhere, but um, you can choose how you answer that, Jerome. Um, I shall, because I only have certain statistics to hand. Um, so um, 
we did a study on African. I mean, it's it's a very it's a it's a tricky question because it depends a bit on what um, debt you're talking about, which countries. I mean, the Caribbean, for example, is incredibly difficult to gener generalize because each country has very different types of creditors. Um, the, the main trend over the last 10 years, which is partly why this crisis is so much more difficult to resolve than the one pre the previous crisis 15 years ago, is that so much more debt is now owed to private creditors. Uh, we did some research on debt, um, external debt owed by African governments. Um, that found that 32%, um, just under a third, was um, owed to other other governments. The same amount, 32%, was owed to um, private creditors, so uh, banks, um, bondholders, um, and um, multilaterals, including the World Bank and the IMF, um, so multilateral financial institutions were owed the rest fractionally over a third. So it's a roughly equal split between those three. But it would be, I mean, the Caribbean would be different. They'd be, have a much larger proportion of private creditors because as richer countries, they, they get less access to, um, to cheap loans from multilater multilateral institutions. Great, thanks Jerome. Um, somebody asked in the chat, um, my concern is that many African countries have accumulated huge debts to China in the last decade, for example, Kenya. How can we in the West have an influence in addressing this problem? Yes, another, another very good question. Um, so one of the reasons one of the reasons we did that research was to um, slightly to push back a bit on this um, this kind of this sort of myth that the, the debt is all owed to China and that they're the problem, which is very popular amongst governments like the UK, uh, the, the the IMF, who want to have some an easy um, target to blame. It's very easy to say China is what's changed. They're doing all these untransparent loans um, and refusing to to cancel any of them. Um, it's not wholly wrong. China has lent a lot. is very secretive about what um, what what it's lent. It has some really weird, problematic um, ways of being repaid that um, can enable it to sort of seize. It seized a port in Sri Lanka, for example, um, when the Sri Lanka couldn't repay. Um, but generally, it's still it's not the biggest creditor, um, as the stats I just gave showed, and it's. Um, well, the Chinese line is um, one of the reasons that um, the common framework is not working and debt is not being cancelled, is that um, the Chinese don't want to um, cancel their debt if um, Western banks are going to um, profit and walk away with um, uh, and be bailed out. The problem is you need to bring together all of the creditors because neither China nor the, the banks nor um, nor governments want to cancel um, Zambia's debt and then have Zambia put all that money, give that money straight to another creditor that hasn't cancelled. That's why we need a common framework or an equivalent with teeth that can bring all creditors to the table at the same time to, to restructure their debts. And there's really very little evidence that China is the main block there. Great, thanks, Jerome. Um, Margaret has asked, wouldn't it be a good idea to emphasize how it is in our benefit to support countries currently suffering from climate change so that we won't be affected by climate change? Um, also, shouldn't we support these countries as we need their resources and also need to be able to trade with them? Uh, sorry, could you say that the first part of the question again? Yes, of course. Um, wouldn't it be a good idea to emphasize how it is in our benefit to support countries currently suffering from climate change so that we won't be affected by climate change? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is this is the climate, um, the, the climate debt um, issue is so important, partly because it's in our own interests. Mm. Um, we can really the 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 debt skeptic who doesn't care about debt justice um, actually has to care about. Um, climate justice because global south countries are not going to um, 
play their part in, in the transition and not able to play their part in the transition unless unless we step up to the debt crisis. So I think it's an important, I don't, I don't think we only have to speak to self-interest because I think that um, people get excited more broadly than that. But um, but yeah, Molly, Molly or Sophie may have thoughts on that as well. Um, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, obviously that shouldn't be the, <laughs> the kind of main narrative because we do want to engage people genuinely with um, the concept that real people are suffering just because they don't live in the same country doesn't mean we shouldn't care about it. Um, but yeah, I think um, that's a it's it's very useful to to make sure we're kind of appealing to a wide wide range of people to kind of make that argument as well. It's kind of very similar to the arguments we could make about vaccine patents. Really, it's kind of you know actually benefits benefits us all to to achieve justice. Um, yeah, so I, I really agree that that's, that can be a useful tactic. Yeah, and can I also just jump in here? I think there are lots of um, arguments that we could use about why we should engage in climate justice and um, conversations around debt. And there'll be, you'll come up, again, we'll come up against lots of different people that um, reject the narrative for whatever reason. And I think really we just need to speak to um, speak to them in, in a language that they that they're kind of tuned into and if that is you know as Margaret says if that's talking about the fact that we're suffering ourselves then we need to we need to be using that narrative and that line I think for me um, being Christian the, the main reason that I'm involved in climate justice is because you know God has given us this incredible um, incredible earth with such beauty in nature and he's given it to us to um, be the caretakers of and to look after and he's also instructed us um, in the new testament to love our neighbor so just because I am my you know heated western house in Bristol I'm not currently experiencing the um, the physical impacts of climate um, of the climate disaster yet doesn't mean that I can't um, pray for and intercede and seek action for my brothers and sisters that are in different parts of the world that are experiencing it, particularly because it's m of my doing and my country's doing. Um, so I think really we just need to be tuning into the, the mindsets that people are in to just kind of do whatever we can to get them in, get them on board and you know, get them engaged in this debate. Thank you, all of you. Actually, also, um, I, I didn't ask the, I didn't address the second half of Margaret's point. Which, um, yes, do you want me to reread that as well? Yeah, in terms of why, which, which shouldn't we be supporting them as we need their resources? Unfortunately, I think it's rather the other way around. I think keeping global south countries in debt bondage is quite a helpful way of um, profiting from extracting their resources whilst they're um, in not unable to um, trade with us on an equal basis. So I don't, unfortunately, uh, as the Surinamese gas drilling example shows. So I, I think, I don't think the the, um, the self-interest argument necessarily works there in the contrast, in the context of a very extractive global um, capitalist system. Great, thank you, Jerome. Um, David, this is just a recommendation that David's put in the chat, which is um, the AXA report, the money drain, um, and there's a link there, which apparently has considerable information on the issues of debt, including the legal and immoral debts owed by African countries. It's well worth reading. So if anyone wants to know more about that, um, you can check that out. We've got a couple more questions. Um, if you've got any final questions, get them in now, because um, I'm just going to ask a few more. So we've got, can the debts be written off under the $100 billion Green Climate Fund? Um, I'll, I'll imagine I'll take this one. Um, the short answer is no. I mean, they, um, and neither should they be. Um, climate finance should be going in um, to meet climate needs, um, adaption and um, mitigation rather than paying off um, BlackRock because of a foolish loan that they, they issued a few years ago. That's not what um, climate finance is for. You also need debt. You need debt. That's why you need debt cancellation and climate finance, because if you don't, then the risk is that unintentionally climate finance ends up um, facilitating Zambia to carry on paying back BlackRock rather than seriously um, addressing the climate crisis. Um, but it's not a route to do that. In fact, um, the um, 
the, many of these funds are involve a large amount of private capital as um, loans. So they're actually um, a lot of climate finance increases debt by um, seeking to seeking to make um, climate adaptation a, um, a suitable for market solutions and a, a way for Global North Capital to make a, a profit again whilst increasing the debt crisis. So no, I mean, there's no, I wouldn't look to that as a solution here. It needs to be, these funds need to be focusing on giving grants uh, alongside debt cancellation. Can I just also jump in here as well? So um, I think I said earlier that the um, YCCN really has four main um, asks for the government. One is about reinstating the foreign aid budget to um, pre-COVID levels. Um, another is about doubling the um, the uh, green climate fund, um, and then the, uh, the the later ones are about um, agreeing a loss and damage policy and cancelling. Um, uh, debts of, of of those poorer or of those um, other countries, um, and I think that though cancelling the debt almost needs to be that top one priority, I do think the other three can work kind of in collaboration with them. I I think that the foreign aid budget isn't um, isn't enough by any stretch. However, in reducing the foreign aid budget to I think being cut by a third, it means that those countries have lost a lot of money that they would have spent on other things that they're now having to spend on, um, you know, on debts and climate um, and and because of the effects of climate um, of the climate disaster. So I think kind of all these four things about counselling debt um, and then still um, these pitch, um, richer, um, wealthier countries giving um, more money. Um, through like the foreign aid budget and the climate, so the green climate fund, all kind of come together to help the bigger picture. I'm not an expert on climate finance, but I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get across what YCCN as an organisation are hoping to achieve. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sophie. Um, we've got one more question for tonight, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, so Karen has asked, would there be any mileage in investing in commissioning TV coverage at the human story level to raise awareness and public understanding and sympathy. I don't know who wants to take that first. I can sort of jump in briefly and then hand over. Um, yeah, I mean, I think something obviously YCCN, we're a very new new um, campaign, so we're learning a lot from groups like Jubilee Debt Campaign. But one thing that we have found to be very effective is, you know, showing visual examples. Um, and so as well as you know getting fabrics from climate vulnerable nations for our boats we've also got lots of video messages um, from individuals um, in particular um, communities uh, for example we've got um, some video messages from uh, pe the people from the village of Wallande in the Solomon Islands um, which is now completely submerged by the sea and so they've had to be displaced um, and yeah it was kind of really powerful to be able to to hear those voices and see people, you know, um, looking over, uh, overlooking the home where, that they once had and that now doesn't exist and speaking to us about, about their life and conveying their messages. Um, and we're, yeah, we're kind of hoping to be able to share these. And I think these kind of visual personal stories can be so, so powerful in suddenly making people realise why, why these issues are important. And I think if a lot of this could be on on national coverage. I think that would be really, really valuable. Great. Do any of the other panelists want to speak to that? No. Great. Thanks so much, Molly. Um, that was a wonderful way to close. And um, I just want to say thank you to Molly and Sophie and to Rome for being here, and also to May and Adrian um, for sending us their videos. Hopefully next time we have Adrian on, he can be here to answer some questions. Um, and thank you to all of you for attending. And we hope this has been informative. If you've got any extra questions or follow up um, reflections or anything that you want to send to us, um, you can get hold of me on info at jubileedebt.org.uk, which is our general email address. Um, Sophie's just said um, that you can go to Sophie of the Year on Twitter, that's in the chat. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. So thanks again to our panellists. Um, good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.